Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. If you've been keeping up with the channel this week, then you likely know that we're doing things a little bit differently because our video editor is away on vacation. Unfortunately, that means we'll only be doing one long form video release today rather than the usual two. However, we're hoping that the case that we've chosen will more than make up for it. If you're bummed out though, don't worry. We'll be back to our usual schedule next week. This is actually a story that we've been wanting to do for a while now, but one that we could never seem to find the right list for. The story is almost too bizarre to believe, simultaneously so cliché that at times it feels like it's ripped from the pages of a lazy mystery novel, while somehow still being genuinely shocking. Before we get to the video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. With that out of the way, this is the case of Stephen and Kimberly Rico. On February 14th, 1998, husband and wife Stephen and Kimberly Rico checked into room 506 at the Harbor Town Golf Resort and Conference Center in St. Michael's, Maryland. The couple had come for a romantic Valentine's getaway at the quiet seaside resort, where they hoped to spend some time alone together, away from the routines of everyday life and from the responsibilities of work and raising their nine-year-old daughter, Anna. Back in their hometown of Laurel, Kimberly worked as a surgical technician at Holy Cross Hospital, and Stephen worked as a golf course superintendent at the Patuxent Greens Country Club. It was actually a friend of Stephen's at the Harbor Town course that had tipped him off about the $239 per couple Valentine's Day package, and after hearing about it, Stephen and Kimberly had decided to attend. Though much of the theme of the getaway was understandably romance, the highlight of the weekend's activities was a murder mystery dinner theater play put on for the guests at the resort. The play was a fun, interactive experience, where guests would talk to the actors and try to solve the mystery. Little did anyone know, however, that they would soon have an all-too-real mystery on their hands. According to media reports and witnesses' accounts, the entertainment began that night around 7 p.m., when guests of the Harbor Town were invited into one of the resort's event halls where the show began. Written by a local playwright named Bobby Bennett's, the show was called The Bride Who Cried and put audience members in the midst of a mock wedding reception. The mystery began when the groom suddenly died after drinking poisoned champagne, leaving the intrigued guests to play detective. Eventually, it was revealed that the bride's mother, played by Bennett's, was the culprit. Those in attendance that night would later say that Kimberly and Stephen showed completely opposite levels of interest in the evening's entertainment. While Stephen didn't seem to be paying that much attention to what was going on, Kimberly was eagerly participating in the performance, and was quick to advance her theory about who had committed the fake murder. Strangely enough, real-life assistant state's attorney Henry Dove was involved in the production and was seated at Kimberly and Stephen's table. He was playing himself in the play and was responsible for helping to facilitate the mock investigation. He would later attest to Kimberly's keen interest in the murder mystery play, and how she even closely followed the groom's body as the actor was wheeled out from the event hall room. The night's festivities came to a close just before 10 p.m., with many guests staying behind for another hour or so to mingle and have drinks at the bar before heading back to their respective rooms. It seemed like the weekend was going perfectly, that was, until a couple of hours later. At approximately 1.30 a.m., Kimberly came running to the front desk of the resort, asking the staff to call 911. She said that there was a fire in her room and that her husband might still be inside. An employee named Elaine Phillips and her cousin Phil Parker, who overheard the commotion, immediately tried to help, and they ran outside to the small cottage room where the Ricos had been staying. Though they managed to drag Stephen's body out of the smoke-filled room, it was too late. He was dead. The tragic news was confirmed when authorities got to the scene just a short time later. Stephen had suffered serious burns to his body from the waist up and was pronounced dead at the scene. Despite Stephen's devastating injuries, firefighters found that the fire had burned itself out by the time they arrived, and that only minimal damage had been done to the room. 
Damage to the bed and the surrounding carpet near the room's fireplace revealed that this was likely where the fire had started. Char marks on the floor further suggested that this had also been the place where Stephen's body was before it was moved. When questioned, Kimberly told investigators that she hadn't been in the room at the time the fire started. According to her, after leaving the murder mystery play, Stephen had pressured her for sex, but she had not been in the mood. She said that this had led to an argument between them, causing her to get into her car and leave the resort. She told police that she planned to drive to a friend's house a short distance away in Easton, but had gotten lost along the way and decided to head back. It was when she tried to go back into her room through the rear sliding glass door that she said she noticed the smoke. Kimberly claimed that she had no idea what had happened, but said that Stephen had been drinking heavily that night and that he occasionally liked to smoke cigars. This seemed to track with evidence that was found in the couple's room. Two empty beer bottles and a champagne bottle were found in the bathroom's trash can, as well as two other partially full beers. A pack of cigars, with one missing from the package, was also found in the room. It appeared that Stephen was the victim of a simple tragedy, and had possibly fallen asleep while smoking. However, detectives weren't so sure. Though they didn't mention any of their suspicions publicly in the absence of an autopsy report, their investigation quickly uncovered some curious details. For starters, though firefighters didn't say that the fire had been deliberately set, there was no evidence showing any accidental cause either. An electrical issue or random lightning strike was ruled out, and there didn't seem to be anything else that fully explained the situation. When they did a little more digging, detectives found out that the Rico's marriage had been more than a little rocky before they arrived for their trip. They had each been seeing separate marriage counselors, and Kimberly was actively involved in an affair with the cousin of one of her close work friends, Jennifer Gowan. Furthermore, when detectives spoke with Stephen's friends, none of them could ever remember him smoking at all, let alone cigars. He was partial to chewing tobacco, but no one remembered him smoking, even recreationally. Though all of these details were suspicious, they were nothing compared to what police would learn from Stephen's autopsy. Not only was there no alcohol found in his system, there was no carbon monoxide either. In fact, despite being badly burned and covered in soot, Stephen had sustained no injuries to his trachea or lungs consistent with dying in a fire. The report concluded that Stephen had been dead before the fire had started. It seemed that police were dealing with a homicide. However, before any of these details could be revealed to the public, the case took another strange turn, when on February 25th, it was reported that Kimberly Rico had been hospitalized. An ambulance had been called to a residence in Easton, where Kimberly had been staying with friends, and she had left after an apparent drug overdose. Things began to make sense a day later, when it was reported that Kimberly had been charged with first-degree murder and first-degree arson in connection with her husband's death. The overdose had been an apparent suicide attempt, as authorities served her with search warrants for her home and car. As a result of the attempt to take her own life, Kimberly was taken to the Clifton T. Perkins Hospital Center for a psychiatric evaluation to make sure that she was fit to stand trial. At this point, a flood of new information also came from multiple witnesses, who added further chilling insights. Several said that they knew that Kimberly had asked for a divorce, but that Stephen did not want one. They alleged that she had made comments to them such as, If I thought I could kill him and get away with it, I would do it tomorrow. And, Stephen would be better off dead. A male co-worker of Kimberly's named Ken Burgess contacted police after learning about Stephen's death and told them that roughly six weeks prior, Kimberly had offered him $50,000 to kill her husband. When he declined, he said that she asked him if he knew anyone else who would be interested. Finally, one unidentified friend claimed that Kimberly had taken her comments even further, laying out an entire plan for Stephen's murder in a conversation they had approximately two weeks before his death. The friend claimed that Kimberly said that she had mulled over the idea of injecting him with a drug that would paralyze him and stop him from breathing. After that, she would set their home curtains on fire with a cigar or candle, burning both the house and Stephen and making it look like he had died in the resulting blaze. 
Kimberly allegedly said that she could easily obtain the drugs she needed from her workplace, and even revealed that she had taken out a $200,000 life insurance policy on Stephen in November of 1996, in which she had claimed that he was a smoker. The allegations were all eerily consistent with what had happened at the Harbortown Golf Resort. When Kimberly was declared mentally fit to stand trial in March of 1998, it seemed like all of the pieces of the investigation were coming together. Kimberly had motive, opportunity, and based on what they had learned from witnesses, detectives were fairly certain they knew how she had carried out the crime. By administering a paralytic drug to Stephen that stopped his breathing, before starting a fire to cover up the crime. However, authorities still had one major problem. The preliminary autopsy was able to show the lack of alcohol and carbon monoxide in Stephen's system, but they would need to wait on the official report from the state medical examiner to hopefully find evidence of the paralytic drug. This was easier said than done, and as 1998 dragged on with no sign of the report, proceedings in the case were delayed. The state ran into further issues when the Talbot County Prosecutor's Office had to be disqualified from prosecuting the case, due to the fact that Assistant State's Attorney Henry Dove had been a witness in the investigation after spending the evening seated at Kimberly's table on the night of Stephen's death. This wasn't a serious problem, as all parties agreed that this decision was for the best, but it still slowed down the proceedings. Finally, at the end of 1998, investigators received the report they had been waiting for from the state medical examiner's office. Though Dr. David Fowler was not able to find any traces of a paralytic drug in Stephen's system, after ruling out death by fire and any other reasonable explanation, he listed Stephen's cause of death as probably poisoning from an unidentified toxic agent. Fowler further concluded that Stephen's death had been a homicide. When the case went to trial in January of 1999, Kimberly's defense team understandably leaned into the fact that no trace of a lethal drug had been found in her husband's system, arguing simultaneously that there was therefore no proof of Kimberly's involvement, and that investigators had not adequately explored alternative explanations for Stephen's death. Prosecutors pushed back on this by presenting the testimony of numerous witnesses, who repeated claims that they had earlier told the media about how Kimberly had wanted her husband dead and had laid out her plan for doing so. During this testimony, several new details were revealed. Elaine Phillips and Phil Parker claimed that on the night that they had witnessed Kimberly reporting that her room was on fire, they had watched her drive directly up to the lobby in her car, switch off her lights, and get out. This suggested that she had not actually come directly from her room, which is how she had initially told police she had discovered the fire. The two witnesses also said that she seemed fairly calm for someone reporting a fire in which she still believed her husband to be trapped, and that Kimberly seemed more agitated than scared. Kimberly's friends Mike and Maureen Miller, whom she had been staying with when she deliberately overdosed, similarly claimed that she acted strange in the aftermath of her husband's death. They said that she was extremely passive when it came to almost all of the arrangements for Stephen's funeral but was adamant that he be cremated as soon as possible. Prosecutors alleged that this was because she wanted any possible evidence that could be recovered from the body to be destroyed. Once again, Kimberly's work friend Jennifer Gowan offered chilling testimony about statements that she had made about wanting to kill Stephen, but this time she went into further detail about what drug she had allegedly used in the crime. In particular, she mentioned a drug named succinylcholine. Succinylcholine is a neuromuscular blocker used in surgeries, most commonly to aid in the insertion of ventilation tubes down a patient's throat. It must be injected, but once it is, it takes effect within one to two minutes, or less than a minute if injected intravenously. The drug causes temporary paralysis of the muscles to the point that a person stops breathing and must be artificially ventilated. If not, they would obviously die within a matter of minutes. At trial, medical experts for the prosecution testified to two important facts about succinylcholine. First of all, it was not a controlled substance at the time the case took place, and thus would not have been an inventory drug, one that is closely watched and monitored, such as most painkillers. Succinylcholine could therefore be found in almost any operating room, and would have been easy for Kimberly to take without notice. 
succinylcholine only remains active in the body for about five to six minutes. It is quickly broken down by natural processes, meaning that it is incredibly difficult to trace, but still definitely lethal enough to kill someone. Prosecutors therefore argued that Kimberly used the drug to kill Stephen before staging the scene to look like an accidental fire. On Friday, January 15, 1999, after three hours of deliberation, jurors agreed with the prosecution and convicted Kimberly Rico of first-degree murder and first-degree arson. Just over two months later, she was sentenced to life in prison plus a 30-year sentence which was to run concurrently. Stephen's friends and family celebrated the decisions, saying that they were satisfied that justice had been done. For her part, Kimberly continued to deny any involvement in her husband's murder, and there were definitely those that took her side. Some wrote into the local papers to say that they believed that she had been given an unfair trial, and that extensive media coverage of the case had prejudiced the proceedings against her. Kimberly seemed to agree with this sentiment, and in May of 2000 appealed her case on several counts, including that the state had failed to sufficiently prove that Stephen's death was the result of a criminal act. Her sentence was upheld by the appellate court, leading her to try again in 2004, this time arguing for a new trial on the grounds that she had received ineffective assistance of counsel from her lawyers back in 1999. However, in 2004, it was again decided that no new trial would be granted. The most recent information that we could find about Kimberly Rico was from an opinion piece that she wrote that was published in the Washington Post in August of 2016. In it, she came out against a recent state law in Maryland that banned inmates from having any physical contact with visitors, and argued that it primarily punished the children and grandchildren of inmates rather than the inmates themselves. So as not to end on a discussion of the perpetrator rather than the victim, we thought we would leave you with the final heartbreaking words Stephen Rico wrote in his journal just two days before he left for his fateful weekend getaway. Quote, Last night, Kim came home about 9.30. She accused me of trying to send her a message because I locked the door and turned out the lights. I locked the door and turned out the lights because I had gone to bed. I want the marriage to succeed, but I won't put up with this treatment. I have a lot to offer someone. This weekend will tell me a lot. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.